So we've been on this journey starting with week one of December talking about the names given to that baby we just saw in that video, the, not that baby, but the baby that was born that first Christmas and placed in a manger. And I've loved this journey. Just kind of recap it. The very first week we said that his name is Emmanuel. And I don't know about you, if you were here three, four weeks ago when we talked about that, it just seems like that's been a real emphasis this Christmas. I've seen so many videos made about explaining that name and what that means and how that impacts our lives. The name Emmanuel means God with us, and that is everything. That is everything. I mean, that's, that explains the point of everything God has ever done. That sums up the entire Bible. From the beginning, from the very first chapter to the last chapter, it's a story of everything God has done to simply be with you and me forever. It's awesome. And then we talked about how his name is Son, Son of Man, Son of David, Son of God. And that got into the weeds of this awesome idea of theology of how he was fully man, but he was also fully God. And because of that, we worship him. We worship him. And then last week, we dealt with a name that's pretty common, the name of Jesus. His name is Jesus, which literally means Savior or Rescuer. And we talked last week about how he came. This sums up Christmas. He came to rescue you. He came to rescue me. That's why he came. So today, we dive into this final name that we're going to look at. His name is Christ. Now, how many of you all, like me, thought Christ was just Jesus' last name? Yeah, Mr. Christ. <laughs> Jesus is his first name. Christ. It's not true, in case you didn't know that, and in case you were shy and didn't want to confess that, that's okay. Uh, I think a lot of people, this, this, Jesus is the first name, Christ is the last name. Actually, a better way to describe that name Christ is it's really a title. In fact, when you see Jesus Christ in the Bible, probably a, a better English rendering would almost be Jesus the Christ. Uh, because that is a title. And I want to explain to you a little bit about this name. Uh, this name literally means anointed one. Christ means anointed one. Anointed one, it means someone set apart for a special purpose. Kings, people were anointed to become a king. And in, in the Old Testament days and even in the New Testament days, that they would anoint someone set apart for a special purpose, even in God's kingdom and God's work and the stuff that he was doing. And so anointed one is what this word means. But it goes a little bit deeper than that because there's another word in the Old Testament that also means anointed one. You know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And the New Testament was written in Greek. So Christ is Christos in the Greek which means anointed one. In the, in the Old Testament, that word is Mashiach, which means anointed one. And that is the word Messiah. So whenever someone in Israel were to hear, whether it be the word Messian or Messiah, Mashiach, or whether it would be the word Christos, they all thought the same thing. The anointed one. The one that was promised and prophesied about throughout the Old Testament. The one who would come to redeem God's people. The one who would come to deliver God's people. The one who would come to establish the kingdom of David once and again forever and ever. That's who they would think about. Now, when you see in the Bible Jesus Christ, I hope that you would think, oh, Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ the Messiah, Jesus, the anointed one, set apart for a special purpose. This is important. In, in fact, and we'll look in just one little verse here in John chapter 1 in the Bible. So Jesus at this point had already began his public ministry and he was calling people to come follow him. And one of the men who had started following him was a man by the name of Andrew. And Andrew was so excited that he went and found his brother Simon Peter. And, and this is what it says in John 1.41. He, meaning Andrew, first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah which means Christ. He came to his brother completely convinced that this man he had met and had only known for a short time, he was the anointed one. He was the one talked about through the Old Testament, the promised one who was anointed to come and redeem his people. Now let's rewind a little bit before that verse and look at the probably most famous historical account of that first Christmas 
in Luke chapter 2. Let me read to you verses 8 through 11, just a little piece of this first Christmas. And it says in verse 8 of Luke 2, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Christ, who is the Messiah, who is the Anointed One, the Lord. Right there, right on the very day that the baby Jesus was born and placed in the manger, an angel announced to these lowly shepherds, if you will, those Appalachian Americans that didn't know they were Appalachian Americans yet. He announced to them the rednecks of Israel, the ones who spread the word. He announced to them, the Messiah has come. He has been born. And this is ultimately the biggest question everyone has to answer. You, me, everyone has the answer. Is Jesus the Christ? That's the big question. Is Jesus the Christ? That's the big one. Jesus, at one point during his ministry, came to a well. He was thirsty. There was a woman there at the well, and he had this long conversation. Talked a lot about water, actually. In fact, at one point, he offered her living water. He was actually offering her eternal life. But, but then he starts telling her everything that a man should not know about her, especially someone she had never talked to before. And she was so in awe of him that she went back into her village and went door to door. And listen to what it says in John 4, 29. She says this, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Can this be the Messiah? Could this, could this be the anointed one? Could this be the one promised all throughout the scriptures? Could this be the one? I don't know. There's something about that question that fills me with great anticipation. And it, and it might describe where you are. Like in this very room, there's so many of us here this morning. You may, there's so many different places represented spiritually in this room right now. Like you might be here and saying, man, I don't even think about Jesus very much. And, and, and I, got, I got kind of bribed to come to church today. I'm going to get me a good lunch after this, you know. I don't know. Uh, or you might be here and say, man, I come here all the time. And man, I, I've been following Jesus and I love Jesus. Or you might be somewhere in between, kind of like maybe this woman was, was like, kind of curious, kind of searching, and like, this, this could be him. Like, I don't know. I don't know for sure. But this Jesus, could he be Lord of all? Could he be the Christ? That might be where you are. There was another really cool moment. Jesus was traveling with these 12 men who had really given up everything to follow him. And he has this conversation. It's really cool. I'm going to read uh, Mark 8, 27 through 29. It says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? It's a really interesting question. That Jesus, whom we worship, he's like, uh, So uh, what are people saying about me, guys? Who, who, who are they saying I am? It's really the only time that we ever see him talk like this in all the Bible. He, he has this moment where he says, who do people say that I am? And, and they answer, they, they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. So the, the conversation was swirling about this man who was making the blind to see, making the lame to walk again, and preaching with authority, and there's nobody like this guy, and could this be the Messiah, just like the woman at the well had said? There was all this rumor swirling around. I mean, Elijah was a prophet in, in scriptures that had never died. He was taken up into heaven, and many believed that he had to come first before the Messiah would come. So maybe this is Elijah. Or John the Baptist, who had given up his life and was martyred for his faith, and maybe he's come back to life, and this is him now. Or maybe he's just one of the other prophets who are awesome that's come back to us somehow. But then Jesus asked this question that is like the most important. In fact, he may have asked you this question already. It says, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. 
You are the Messiah. I believe that you are the anointed one. I believe that you are Lord. You are God in the flesh. That you are the one who came to rescue us. You are my Redeemer. You are my Savior. He declared his faith right there. And that's what we all face. Listen, Jesus just draws this line in the sand. I mean, he either is the Christ, and you believe that, or you believe he's not. And that's probably one of the most important questions you'll ever determine in your life is, is where you stand with this question. Who do you say that I am? Do you say, do you say he is the Christ? Have you done that? Have you declared that in your life yet? And, and listen, we, we, don't, we don't know exactly what Peter was thinking when he said that. And we've made much of this that the people who lived in the first century, even those who believed that Jesus was the Christ, they may have thought he was really coming to just kick Rome out of Israel, establish a socio political kingdom, you know? <laughs> there were those who saw Jesus do these amazing miracles, speak with great authority. And those who encountered that and saw that and, and, and experienced His grace and His love, many of them believed. But there were many who did not believe too. And there were even those who not only did they not believe, they felt it was their call, it was their mission to rid themselves of this nuisance. This man who claims to be, or people say, is the Christ. There's no way He is. There's no way he is. In fact, it's our duty to rid the world of him. Interestingly enough, ironically enough, they simply played right into God's plan. Because he did not come to defeat Rome. He had come to defeat sin. He had come to defeat the darkness. He had come to defeat the grave. He had come to defeat hell itself. And that's what he came for. To establish that kingdom forever and ever. <laughs> he established his kingdom not by taking up a scepter, but by taking up a cross. During Jesus' last meal, before he did take up that cross, he was having this meal with his 12 men who had given up everything to follow him. And it says this in Matthew 26, 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he says something interesting. He then says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, if you've been coming to church for any length of time, you can already say, oh, this is a passage I may have heard before. It's a passage we often read before we observe the Lord's Supper. And if you're wondering what this is, that's what, that's what we're going to do here in a few moments, is observe the Lord's Supper. And it was established, this passage is, is why we observe the Lord's Supper in churches today, is because he, he, he said that... Do this in remembrance of me. We, we do this to remember that this baby that was placed in a manger, yay, praise God, hallelujah, that was awesome, but he came with a purpose to defeat sin, death, hell, and the grave. And he did that by taking up a cross, by allowing his body to be beaten and allowing it to be pierced. And allowing his blood to be spilled. And so the, bre the bread represented his body and the juice represented his blood. And he was explaining that this is what's about to happen. And this is how I'm establishing my kingdom. And I guarantee you that those men in that room probably did not grasp it. Because we're still trying to grasp it in many ways, aren't we? But I bet they didn't grasp it quite yet. But he was telling them, well, you're going you're gonna to look back. And I think there was an aha moment once they saw the risen Jesus before he ascended to heaven. There was this aha moment like, that's what he meant in that last meal. That's what he meant. And so that's pretty cool. But then he said this interesting thing that I won't drink. I will not drink from the fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 
See, what we sometimes fail to realize is that observing the Lord's Supper, it isn't just a commemoration, it's an anticipation. We remember that Jesus came and what he did for us, but we also anticipate that he's coming again. You can sum up all of Christmas in this. Jesus came, the Christ came, and he's coming again. We have been talking about these prophecies that were fulfilled when that baby was born and placed in a manger. And man, I get geeked out about that because it's like the odds of that many prophecies in the Old Testament being fulfilled by one event are just astronomical. Unbelievable, actually. And yet they're real. And I'm almost none to them in some ways, but then I'm pumped about them at the same time. But then I'm reminded with you this morning that there is still prophecy that we're waiting to be fulfilled. When you think about it, how much different are we now today than things were the first century? When people were longing for the Messiah to one day come, being ruled by Rome. I mean, let's think about what they dealt with. Let's think about the things that Jesus dealt with when he walked this earth in the first century. Disease, political upheaval, darkness, addiction, Confusion, hate, war. Hmm. Well, we still got that, don't we? In many ways, we too await for something different. And I will tell you what we're waiting for. It describes it in another prophecy in the Bible that is not fulfilled yet. Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 3. It says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Yes, I am blessed today. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> hey, and if that's not good enough, it says, and blessed are those who hear. That's you. We're blessed today together. And who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. John, and this is the one that God inspired to put these words down. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. Prophecy. Yet to be fulfilled. And I hope that you're in a place where you long for its fulfilling. That you long for His coming. Because He came and He's coming again. Let me say it this way. Christ came for us. And He's coming again for us. It's why He comes. It's for you. Just like His name is Emmanuel. He just wants to be with you forever. That's why He's coming. And so today, we want to think on that. We want to marinate in that. We want to celebrate that. We want to commemorate and anticipate as we observe the Lord's Supper together. In just a few moments, our deacons, our spiritual servant leaders of the church, are going to come and we're going to first serve the bread. Now listen, where you are spiritually right now, if you're like, man, I don't even know if I believe any of this or not. Like, you can just let the plate pass by. You're like, oh, I'm just going to observe today. That is totally fine. There's no judgment here. But if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you're welcome to observe this today. We want you to partake. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. You don't have to be a member of this church or anything like that. But if you've placed your faith in Christ and you've said He is the Christ, and you take of that bread as it comes by you, as it passes down, Hold on to it. We're going to wait till everyone is served. And then we're going to give a prayer and just thank God for it and partake together. And then our deacons will once again serve the cup of juice. And once everyone is served, we will pray and then partake of that again as well. And the reason we do that is because He came and He's coming again. Now for just one more moment, 
Listen closely. There's only one thing that you need to be thinking about as we close our time together. The next step that you got to take in light of everything we've talked about today is this. Get ready. That's it. He's coming. He came. And he's coming back. So get ready. I want to tell you how you get ready. In Grove Kids, in the top two floors of that building next door, we, we tell them this all the time. They could probably tell you this if you got kids over there. Say, tell, tell me the ABCs. Oh, yeah, they'll probably tell it to you. If they've been here one or two times at least, they'll tell you. It's as simple as ABC to get ready for Jesus' coming. Admit, believe, and commit. Admit you need him. Admit you need a savior. You need a rescuer. Believe that Jesus is that rescuer. That he came for you. And then C, commit your life to him. Because if you just do A and B, that's the devil did that. He, he knows. He knows what's up. He knows who he is. But it's when you move it from here to here, 14 inches down to your heart and say, I worship him. I give my life to him. That's when you actually will change. When your life changes. When your world changes. Is when you do that. That's how you do it. Romans uh, 10.13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All you got to do, it begins with a simple prayer just saying, Okay, Jesus, I believe you are the Christ. I believe you came for me. So, Father, I give my life to you. If you do that, if you've never done that before, and you do that right here, right now, today, I'm just going to go ahead and say, Merry Christmas and Hallelujah. <laughs> Because that's what Jesus came and was placed in a manger to accomplish. If you've done that already, then your next step is help others get ready. The reason He has not come back, the reason that prophecy in Revelation 1 has not been fulfilled is because of another thing He says in 2 Peter, that he is not slow in coming, as some have said. Instead, he is patient, not willing that anyone perish. That's why he's not come back. You are sitting in the most lost county in all the state of Kentucky, Kenton County, 85%, completely unchurched. We have an opportunity to take hope to the lostness. We have an opportunity to link arms together and pray for those who are yet to know Him as Savior and do something about it. Talk about Him. Show, him, show others Jesus with our very lives the way we live them. And by so doing, we can eradicate lostness and give someone a chance. Just give someone a chance to move from being lost to being found in Christ. That's why we're still here. That's why He's not come back yet. So... Either get ready or help someone else get ready. That's really the only right response. So will you do that today? Will you bow your heads with me? If where you're sitting, you've never put your faith in Jesus, you've never committed your life to Him, I invite you to pray to Him right now and just simply say, Jesus, I believe you are the Christ. I believe that you came for me and that you're coming again for me. And so right now, please, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And I give my heart to you now. That's why Jesus came, was placed in the manger, is to hear you say those words. And if you've prayed that right now, I want you to know you are a child of God forever. The best thing ever. And now if you've already done that, however long ago that was, maybe right now in the quietness of this moment, there's someone in your life, someone in your neighborhood, someone at your school, someone on your campus, someone in, on your team, someone in the next cubicle over, just there's somebody that you're thinking, I don't think, I, I don't think they have this hope that I have. And they need it. Pray for them right now. And maybe even if you dare, pray that God would use you to take that hope to them by word and by deed. 
Father, we come before you now. And Lord, there are those praying to you right now, maybe for the first time asking you to redeem them, to save them, declaring that you are the Christ. And Lord, I pray that that they would know you hear their prayers and that you've taken up residence within them and that they are now, you are now with them forever. Emmanuel, God with us. Help them to know that and be ready for the change that you're going to do in their lives from here on out. And Father, there are those names and faces that came to our mind as we think about those who may not have the hope that we have and we lift them up to you now, not because we're better than them, but because we were once there too need that hope and they need that love too use us to take it to them to help them get ready Lord we love you and we thank you and we ask it all in the name of your son Jesus the Christ Amen